Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about chapter 22, saving the interest rate and then the market for loanable fund. All right, so let's get started. Um, this is a pretty simple chapter. It's mostly just definitions and con uh, very easy concept. Uh, not much calculations, so it should be a pretty good chapter to understand this, okay? So uh, so first, know what's a loanable fund. Uh, loanable fund, this is just talking about um, the money you save. So how much money do you save and how much money do you borrow all those transactions are done within a loanable fund. Now, the most common loanable fund we are familiar with is our commercial banks. So commercial banks, there are such the companies such as um, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, so your local banks, they're the commercial banks, which offer saving for consumers and then lending for business. Um, and then you have something called a mutual fund firms. So mutual fund, this is company like your Charles Schwab or, or Invesco, which they will, uh, they will take investors money and then purchase a mutual fund or offer mutual fund for sale. Um, and then that's mutual fund firms. And then you have investment bankers, uh, investment bank, uh, the most well-known investment bank is your, um, Goldman Sachs, uh, which also take investment money uh, from investors and then offer investment in all kind of areas. And last one is just our stock exchange. Uh, so your New York Stock Exchange, Dow Jones, your Nasdaq, uh, they're also part of a loanable fund because they're basically taking money from investor and give to somebody else. So that's the same with loanable fund. It's just taking money from person A and then give it to person B. That's loanable fund market. Um, so. Um, the saver in this case, they're the uh, they're, they're, um, the savers will save money and then give it to the business, and then um, the borrower will use the money to run the business. So there are two side two side of the same equation: saver save money and then borrower borrow money. All right, so the process um, we're gonna make some easy assumptions here. We're gonna assume the savers, so people who save money, there are people who are in the household, so they're individual uh, consumers. And then foreign entities such as um, foreign investors, they're part of our savers market. They're the people who save money, and then when they save the money, they will give the money to our uh, loanable fund market in the form of you know banks or bond or stocks. And then this money will be borrowed um, by our borrower, which is the firms, um, government. Now, uh, in most cases, household and also foreign entity also borrow money. But we're going to ignore that. Okay, so for this chapter, we're going to assume the only people who borrow money are the companies and also our government. By the way, our government, especially U.S. government, the federal government, is a big part of this borrower business. That for the U.S. government, they borrow twenty-one trillion dollars, so a lot of money. Okay, all right. Um, so the process, the reason why, the reason why a company borrow money is to uh, run their business and then expand as soon as possible because otherwise you'll be missing other opportunities. So the timeline for borrow money is that they will borrow money today uh, and then with the money they borrow, they'll they buy the capital, so buy the machines, buy the, buy the technologies. They will hire workers, produce the good, and once they make a profit, they'll use the profit to pay back the loan and then pay the workers and therefore whatever is left over, that is their profit. Okay, so for business, borrow money really makes sense because otherwise they have to wait to save enough money and then run the business. Now, if that's the process, they will lose a lot of opportunities. I mean, imagine that if you have this new um, idea about computers you want to make, like a brand new computers that yours is faster than anybody else, if you're gonna wait for like three, four years before you can save enough money to run the business, by then your technology will be obsolete. So that's why companies, they don't want to wait. Nobody wants to wait. They'll borrow money, run the business, and then pay the loan back. All right, so um, also remember this, that because the every money borrowed is the money saved, so how much money we save um, is equal to how much money we borrow. <laughs> I can write it on, write it. Saving equals to borrow. All right, um, and then for this borrow, um, now in the old, in the previous chapters that um, we, we, we told you that uh, the consumption is a big part of our GDP and at any time your consumption is increasing, that will increase our GDP. Now for saving money, it will be the similar process. It can also impact our GDP. So when you save money, this money will be borrowed by business and business will use the money to buy capitals, to buy equipment and that's part of the investment and investment is part of GDP. So when you save money, that this process will also increase our GDP, okay? Because investments increased. 
All right, so um, now what's the interest rate? So you guys probably all know what this is, right? So interest rate is that whenever you go to the uh, bank, save your money, that they pay you something a little extra, that's your interest rate. Or when you borrow money from the bank, they charge you a little extra, that's also interest rate. Now for interest rate, guys, I want you to think this as the price of money. I mean, if you guys really think about it, that sounds pretty strange, right? What the hell is a price of money? Isn't money money, right? Why would there be a price of money? So the price of money is how our cons uh, how money is being charged, or money is being um, spended, or money is being borrowed. So which means that any time when our people borrow money, that there is a price for it, and that price is called interest rate. Okay, so. So interest rate is just the cost of borrow money. It's also the reward of saving money. That any time when our consumers save the money in the bank, they will get a reward for it, and that is our interest rate. So for this um, money, money is like anything else. Um, the more you have it, the lower the price is. Uh, the less you have it, the higher the price is. And that price is called interest rate, okay? So if you look at the supply demand graph, uh, for the money market. Uh, it's very similar to, to everything else we learned before. So you have your supply curve going upward, um, demand curve going downward. And then, but notice over here, this one says interest rate, right? So, so this is not a price anymore. This is the price of money, which is called an interest rate. And on the horizontal axis, that is the quantity of money. So between your savers and a borrower together, we decide what is the interest rate and what is the quantity of money. Um, so also remember your save uh, your supply side are the savers, they're the, the one who is saving money. The demand side um, is the borrower, so the business who will use the money to buy investment. All right, so a little math over here, just a little bit, not too much. Um, let me show you how, how interest rate works. So interest rate, uh, just this will be just a, um, a Think this as a as a saving account, okay? So you save five hundred dollars in the bank, and then bank says I will pay you a three percent interest rate. So a three percent out of uh five hundred that's a fifteen dollar per year. So by end of the year, you will get your five hundred back, and then plus fifteen dollars. So this is on top of your five hundred. So that is the reward for saving money. Um, Keep in mind uh, that your loanable fund market also follows the law of supply. So remember, we learned this in chapter three. We said um, every time when the price goes higher, the company wants to produce more of it. In the loanable fund market, um, it's very similar definition, but which going to replace price with with interest rate, and then um, company produ production replaces people saving money. So the law of supply in this case will tell you that. When the interest rate goes higher, people want to save more money. And when the interest rate goes lower, then people want to save less money. So for our example here, imagine this is not a 3%, this is a 30% interest rate. For a 30% interest rate, the interest on it, so 500 times 30%, that will be $150. Now before it's only $15, but now it's $150. That is a lot more, right? So which means give us more incentive to save more money. So at a higher interest rate, we save more money. At a lower interest rate, we save less money. That's the law of supply in this case. All right, so just uh, just to show you how your interest rate is affected by your um, something called a future value, okay? So um, so the higher the interest rate, um, the higher the in the future value is. I mean that makes sense, right? The, the the higher the interest rate somebody pays you, the more money you get back in return, and then therefore the higher the future value is. So this value is how much money you have after one year. All right, um, and then for a company who borrow money, um, the cost of borrow money is interest rates. So how much they must the company must pay back for the loan. Um, so whenever a company try to make a decision when they try to borrow money, they will decide um, what is the expected rate of return on investment and then compared to what is the interest rate on the loan. Now the, the benefit of this comparison is that we're doing something called a cost-benefit analysis. We're comparing what is the cost for, the, for, for this project and what is the benefit for this project. Now your expected return on investment, that is just the profit. So how much profit do you expect to have from this one project? Now let's suppose that for our project, we're gonna open a business 
and then um, for our business we expect for the entire year we're gonna make a 10% I'm doing a dollar term so a 10% profit now imagine when you go borrow money that will only cost you 5% interest rate what you know that's pretty good because reason why because you, you know it will only cost you 5% to borrow money but for the 5% money you borrowed you can make a 10% profit so you are keeping the extra 5% as a true profit after all the expenses, including interest rate. So whenever your your return on investment or profit is more than the interest rate on the money you borrow, you are doing pretty good because you are making a profit in this case. So you're gonna borrow more money. Okay. Um, all right. This gotta know something called a Fisher equation. So it's also one of the easier equations in this chapter. Um, this just shows you. The relationship between the uh, something called a real interest rate and a nominal interest rate and the inflation. So real interest rate um, is the interest rate um, that's um, how do I put this? Think this as a profit. Okay, that's your profit. Um, this nominal rate is how much interest rate uh, does pay for you uh, pay you on paper. Okay, this is the interest rate on paper. Now. Um, and the inflation is just inflation. Inflation, remember the from chapter 21, it just says when the price level goes higher, uh, that's inflation. So um, the reason why they're connected, let me give you a scenario. That suppose you go to the bank, let's say Bank of America. <coughs> and then Bank of America says, um, if you save your money there, they will pay you a 10% interest rate. Well, pretty good. But however, what if by end of the year, the price of everything will increase by 100%? So price all double, but your money in the bank only increased by 10%. Well, that is not enough, right? So in this case, we need to know what is our real interest rate, your true profit, um, to compare to see if this saving is a good idea. So the real interest rate equal to the nominal interest rate, which this is how much the bank pays you, minus inflation, that's the real interest rate. So, so in our case before, you know, if the bank pays you 10%, inflation is 100%, uh, and therefore your, your real interest rate will be a negative 90%. That means when you save your money in the bank, you won't make a profit, you actually lose money in this case, okay? Um, so anytime your real interest rate is positive, that means it's good, that means you make a real profit, but anytime if your real interest rate is negative, that means, well, you lose money. So even though you might have a positive nominal interest rate, but because the inflation is so high, it's eating away all the profit you have, and at the end, you actually lose money. So you can have a negative real interest rate, okay? All right, so this shows you uh, our historical nominal and real interest rate. Now notice that our nominal rate is pretty much always positive, uh, except the last couple of years uh, has been close to zero. Uh, by the way, for the last couple of years, the nominal interest rate in the economy is about 0.25%. Uh, it's almost zero percent um, but however notice the real interest rate here negative right negative so sometimes uh, what you even though you might you're gonna have a positive nominal interest rate but because the inflation is eating away the profit that you're gonna end up with a negative real interest rate so for example in the year uh, what is it, 1984 in 1984 or 85 if you save your money in the bank even though the bank might pay you like a 10, 15% interest rate, but in reality, you're actually losing money because the inflation is so high, okay? All right, um, so let's talk about this supply for uh, for loanable fund market. Okay, so what will cause some movement or a shift? So uh, just like our regular supply curve, every time the price change, it will cause a movement along the supply curve. But remember um, that this is not a price anymore. This is an interest rate. So anytime the interest rate change, uh, you're not going to shift your line. You move from one point to the next point. So A to B, that's why only your interest rate is changing. Now, however, if you have this three factor change, this will shift your supply curve. So if it's increasing, you go to the right. Uh, if it's decreasing, you go to your left. Okay, so let's look at these three factors over here that can cause a shift of supply curve for loanable fund. Um, so basically, how much money are we saving? So first one is your income. Um, anytime our consumer income or wealth is changing, so we have more income available, we tend to save more money. Now, vice versa, if you have less income avail available, you will save less money. Okay, so income goes up, 
saving shifting to the right, uh, income goes down, then saving or shifting to the left. And the next is called time preference. Uh, just this is just your preference on how um, how do you manage your in, how how do you manage your money? Do you do you want it now? Do you want it later? Um, so this is just personal preference. And then for personal preference, this is a big determinant for our savings market because if our people, if imagine our consumers are very patient, so uh, we can wait. We're willing to wait. And guess what? In that case, then people will save the money in the bank for a longer time. And therefore have a higher income in the future now however if if the consumers individuals are impatient they don't want to wait then we're going to save less money and then we have more consumption today but less money for the future okay so how much your time preference is can determine how much you're saving is and then a little, little example here so we're going to make a decision between uh, go to get a job now or go to school so if you're a very patient person you are going to school because when you go to school, you're giving up your current income and consumption, but you're going to have a higher income consumption in the future. Now, however, if you are impatient, you're going to go to go to work immediately and have a higher income today. And who care about tomorrow? OK, so that's that's the difference between preference. So imagine you have a hundred dollars. Would you want to save this in the bank, uh, which means you're going to wait for it, but you can have a higher income in the future? Or would you prefer to spend the money now and then forget about the future? That's your time preference. All right. Um, the last one that can shift our supply curve for a loanable fund is something called a consumption smoothing. Now, uh, let me show you guys a graph over here. You're gonna, you probably gonna see this. You saw saw this graph probably before in your um, EDUC class uh, that shows you the consumption behavior and the saving behavior for most people in the economy. So in your early, in your early life, uh, you have very little income here, but you need to spend the money. So what do you do? You borrow money. So especially for you guys now who are in school, uh, more than likely you're, you're borrowing money for school, right? But as your as your career goes on uh, take off, your, your income will go up and then your consumption go up too, but at, at a lower rate, and then you can have uh, extra money around the saving. So for most people in the in the middle part of their life, they will save some money on the side. Um, part of it is to pay off their um, their borrow money at the beginning of the life, so your student loan, and then part of it is for retirement. So once you retire, so once you get to your the later stage of your life, uh, you're gonna stop working, so income goes down, uh, but your consumption can still stay pretty smooth because you have saving from before. So this process, you see how the income is more dramatic right it goes up and down really by a lot but consumption is pretty smooth that's called consumption smoothing so another factor why our consumer are saving money is try to smooth out our our consumption rather than income okay so income uh, so so increasing to the right decrease to the left so we talk about this um so anytime you're between uh, between your saving and an income you have a positive relationship um, between time preference and a uh, saving. You have a negative relationship, relationship, and then between consumption soothing and then your um, saving, there's also a positive relationship. That as you're getting uh, more closer to your main life, your uh, your saving is higher. But vice versa, if you're getting away from main life, so either getting younger or older, uh, then your saving goes down. Okay. All right, so this is the saving rate in America. Um, notice that for the last 40 years or so, saving rate has been going down. But um, by recession, by 2008, saving rate actually went up. <laughs> so many economists was, um, was thinking that one positive thing that come out of this recession, the last recession, was that it forced our consumer to save more money. Okay, so that's, that's like the one, one of few upset in the economy because of recession. All right, so, so the demand for loanable fund uh, is that for uh, demand who are, they're the company who need to borrow money um, for, for their project um, and also government need to borrow money too. And remember for US government, they are borrowing right now $21 trillion, okay? That's a lot of money. Um, if you if you want to see how much it is, um, go to a website called usdebtclock.org. Um, that will show you how much money the government is borrowing right now. 
All right, so for our demand curve uh, for the loanable funds is that uh, just like supply curve, every time interest rate change, your demand curve uh, is moving on the same demand curve. So A to B, that is your um, interest rate change, okay? However, if these two factor changes, we're shifting our demand curve, increasing to the right, decreasing to your left. So just like regular demand curve. Now let's look at how this will change. Um, so the first shifter for demand is called productivity of capital. So imagine if our capital or even our, our employees are more productive, then what do you think company will do? They will hire more employees or they will, they will buy more capital. So imagine that we have a new technology that will make production more efficient, but it's pretty expensive. Now what do companies do? They will borrow money to buy the equipment, right? So that will increase our demand for borrow money. Or maybe you have a, a change in consumer confidence, or in this case, it's called investor confidence. So for the investors, everybody feel very optimistic about the company. Everybody all believe that this company will have a very good future. Well, guess what? Um, then those investors will put in more money into the company and the demand for borrow money goes higher, okay? All right, so increase to the right, decrease to your left, talk about this. Uh, so when you put it together, add equilibrium between your supply for loan of a fund and the demand for loan of a fund, the intersection, you're gonna have your equilibrium. And then for this equilibrium, you're gonna decide, you're gonna find out uh, what is the interest rate in the economy and what is the amount of money in the economy, or at least in the loan of a fund market. All right, so add equilibrium. Uh, you have no surplus, no shortage, just like before. And in this case, that you're saving, how much money you save, equal to how much money your investment is. Okay, so every dollar borrowed is coming from every dollar saved. Um, we talked about this already, but let's imagine this one more time. So, um, investor confidence again. This is how confidence business feel about the future. Um, every time when the when the investors in the company feel very secure, very confident about the future, then they tend to borrow more money for the business. But if vice versa, they don't feel very secure about the future, then they, they tend to borrow less money for the business, regardless what the interest rate is. Okay, so back in 2009, 2008, uh, when, the, when the economy was going through recession, um, and the business was slowing down at a very low interest rate, most companies still wouldn't borrow money because the investor confidence was very, very low, okay? All right, um, next. Well, not next, it is next. So so this would be example of the recession. So you see how in 2008, 2009, that uh, our interest rate went down um, and then our, our money borrowed also went down. So because our demand for investment goes lower, so demand for money, a uh, demand for borrow money also goes down. So interest rate goes lower, money borrow goes lower. And that is how you see this decline over here. Okay, so every time economy slows down, you're gonna see this decline of borrow money. And then when the economy is going up, you're gonna see an increase of investment. Okay. So for the last maybe um nine years or so, eight years or so, ever since 2010, uh, the investment component of the US economy has been increasing. Um, because our investor confidence has been improving, especially for the last three to four years. All right, so uh, some little brief future, a glimpse into the future about the loan market, a loanable market uh, in the in the economy, um, that the saving rate for the U.S. economy has been falling for the last 30 years. Uh, that there have been a couple of reasons. So first, because um, the consumer um, time preference has been changing. That for many people, many consumers, we don't we want to care about the future, but we don't care about the future that much, and we care more and more about the current condition of the economy, and especially for our current condition of the individual consumers. We want to buy more stuff. You want to buy a car. You want to buy a house. You want to buy your PS4, Xbox, and all those consumption you want to make is decreasing how much money we're saving. So that's. Uh, that would, that's changing our time preference, which means our loan fund market has been shifting to the left. Well, so this is wrong, it should be supply, okay? So loan fund market has been shifting to the left for how much money that's available for saving. Uh, but what is helping is that uh, many of the foreign investors are now putting money into the US economy. 
So even though our our domestic savers are shifting to the left now, but the foreign savers are shifting our supply curve to the right. So they actually cancel all each other for now. So our our um supply for loan reform market um, has been pretty steady for the last 30 years. Um, but there's another thing they got to worry about is that um, uh, something called the baby boomers. So this is for anybody who was born between 1945 to 1965. Now, if you guys um, want to do the calculation, so take 2018 minus 1945, uh, that means for, for, the, for the first batch, uh, for the beginning of our baby boomers, um, they are now retired in the economy. And if our consumption smoothing model is correct, then those people are now going into this borrowing market, that they are switched from saving to borrow market. So the demand for borrow money will increase, but the most important part is that the supply for borrow money will decrease. Okay, when the supply decreases, there are less money available for investment. Therefore, this will reduce our uh, economic growth in the future. Okay, so which means we might need more this or weaker foreign saving. All right, so guys, um, that's it for this chapter. Okay, so have any question, let me know, and I'll see you for chapter 24. All right, bye-bye.